with you guys. And so Monday I'm in here, and, and this is my domain uh, from, for an hour each morning. And I just walk up and down, I pray, I sit here in the hot seat, and I pray and I worship and all that kind of stuff. And so as I was doing that, God began to speak to me and, uh, about another sermon series, hallelujah. And so I'm like, yes, God, this is awesome, you know, and I'm getting excited and all that kind of stuff. Lori, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because you do the same thing. And, uh, and I'm just, uh, I'm thinking, like, this is the direction God wants to go, right? And so uh, I get uh, Thursday morning, and I sit down on my computer, and I'm looking at my screen, and I open up my Word document. I'm starting to type stuff out, and then I start researching stuff, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, there's just something just deep down, you know, just right here, like, this ain't it. You know, I mean, uh, Lori, you ever experienced that before? And uh, it's probably happened like three times since I've been here. It's like this is not it. And then, I, and then I'm panicking, okay? So I'm like, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm looking at different scripture, and I'm, th I'm thumbing through the Bible, and then I'm looking at stuff that I read over the last three days, and it's like nothing is happening, and I'm freaking out more and more. And so I sit there and... Uh, and I say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I was hoping he would say, just take that Sunday off. <laughs> but he didn't. But he reminded me of last Sunday morning. Now, how many of you were here last Sunday morning? It was amazing. Tamara Klein gave an incredible testimony. And, uh, and I had talked out of, Psalm 91, and I went so fast, none of you actually heard me, and God spoke to me and said, I want you to go back to that, and I was like, well, that makes my day easy, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then I went home, and I told Karen, I was like, I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do what I did before, and she's like, yeah, that's what I told you to do in the first place. <laughs> And so we're going to revisit Psalm 91, and, and I'm, not, I'm not doing it because, you know, it's easy or whatever. I'm doing it because, number one, God told me to do it. But number two, um, I got a phone call this week, and it was from one of my leaders. And this leader told me, Pastor Chris, I, I know that there are people in our church that are going through difficult things. They're going through emotional things, okay? What do I mean by that? She said, Pastor Chris, there's people in your congregation that are facing fear, they're facing anxiety, they're facing financial troubles, they're facing, and, and, and they, they just start listing off all this stuff. And I was like, okay. So when I look at Psalm 91 and how... David, how David put these words and these phrases together, it identifies the God that we serve is greater than all of these things emotionally, physically, or spiritually that we face. Can you say amen? And, and I want to, I know I, I'm kind of doing ADD here. I'm sorry. I, I'm kind of skipping around. But I was, I, was, uh, I was sitting around the house before everybody was up, and I was thinking, actually I was experiencing how just how blessed we, we are as a family. And God reminded me that what you sow into is what you're going to reap. Okay, that's, that's biblical. I mean, go into scripture and Jesus says that. What you sow is what you're going to reap. And so I'm thinking about what my leader was saying, how People struggle with, with fear, and they struggle with anxiety, and they, they struggle with depression, and they struggle with, um, yeah, I mean, wh wh what other things do you struggle with, right? What, whatever things that you're struggling with, like lack of this or lack of that or, or whatever it is that, that is, that is because you're sowing into whatever that is. Whatever pain that is, you're, when you're thinking about it constantly and constantly, constantly, you're sowing into that. You're giving yourself over to that. But I, w I believe that God is here to tell you that you've got to stop sowing into that and start sowing into the kingdom of God, the, the, uh, the Godhead himself. 
everything that he has for you. Can you say praise the Lord? And so we look at Psalm 91, and, and this is what the Bible says. He who dwells in the seeker place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word today. And I thank you, Father, that you've got a specific plan for someone, all of us, I don't know. I just, that's my expectation, God. And so, Father, we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that we would see that which you want us to grab a hold of today. For some of us, it might be repetition. We heard it before. For others of us, though, it may be new. But whatever position of the table we're sitting at, God, that we would hear your voice very clearly, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we ask it, and everybody said amen. So I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn to Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 3. And, and this is what Isaiah said, speaking of Jesus Christ, but it means so much to us today. Did I mess up here? 61. Yeah, I was looking at chapter 63. I'm like, this is not it. Uh, 61 verses 1 through 3. This is what the Bible says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty. Turn to your neighbors and say, Liberty! To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To counsel those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Come on church. That they may be called trees. Oak trees. Those things that last a long, long time. That they may call trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Listen, when you think about fear, anxiety, stress, all those emotional struggles that you face today, that means you're in bondage to that stuff. That, that's, a, that's a bondage thing, and God wants you to be free of that. He wants you to be liberated from that. He doesn't want you to go walking around in depression and discouragement and bondage to whatever it is that you're struggling with from day to day. He wants to give you victory today, opening the prison doors wide. Can you say, praise the Lord? Can you say, praise the Lord? Lord. Now you're awake. And so Psalm 91, he talks about God in a way that should really blow our minds. Help us to understand that we have that victory. And so we look at that first word in Psalm 91. Name of God. It's the Most High. Most High is Elion. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, in, in height and in inches and in feet and miles. It talks about above everything else in authority. I mean, he's over that fear. He's over that depression. He's over that financial problem. He's over that relational hurt, that whatever it was. He's over that marriage, marriage struggle. He's over that. He's more powerful than that. And so he's saying, why are you focusing on this when you should be focusing on me? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. If you look in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews talks about this guy by the name of Melchizedek. And then if you go back to Genesis 14, you see that Melchizedek, king of Salem, he said this about God. He who was the priest of God Most High, El Elyon, God Most High. 
that he is above everything. He is, he is the one that I am going to look to. I'm not going to look to my problem. I'm not going to look to my situation. And he blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, El Elyon, the God Most High, the, the guy that's bigger than anything, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered me. Elion in the Greek, most high, it means the uppermost. We talked about this last Sunday. It means, it means a three-story building, and God is on the top level. He is the uppermost. And then we see in Psalm 91 that we have this other name that the psalmist says, and he says, Almighty shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Well, what does that mean? It means Shaddai. Shaddai, the Almighty. In Genesis 17, 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. I am El Shaddai, Almighty God. What does that mean? It means he is the God that is all sufficient for you. Whatever you're facing today, you call on El Shaddai, God Almighty, and you are saying, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know where it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I am going to trust in you and not in my circumstance. Come on, church. And he will provide. It's the expectation. Right, Tamara? It's the expectation. Expectation is going to direct your attitudes, and your attitudes are going to direct your behavior. Can you say amen, church? Amen. And it all starts with your expectation of El Elyon. It's, all your, it's your expectation on El Shaddai, God Most High. Where are we placing our expectation? And then the psalmist, after he identifies uh, our source and our foundation, then he moves on to our responsibility, what we're supposed to do. And, and I want you to gauge it seriously. Allow me as your pastor to get in your face this morning, to get up in your grill. Right, Gary? You love it? You want me to get up in your grill a little more? Come on, brother. And so, and so then the psalmist, he says, now this is your responsibility. I'm telling you, who my God is and who your God is, now I'm telling you what your responsibility is to that God, your God. And he says, those who what? Dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And so your responsibility, believer, church, Christian, you call yourself a Christian, it's your responsibility to dwell. Now we know how to dwell, don't we, Rick? We get off work, we know, how, we know how to dwell, okay? I mean, my dwelling place when I get home is my recliner that I push a button and it kicks out. You know what I mean? I know how to dwell. But that's not necessarily the kind of dwelling that God and, and the psalmist is telling us to do. It means to sit, abide, inhabit, or remain, okay? It doesn't mean to go home from work, sit down on your easy chair, your lazy boy, push the button and turn the TV on. That's not what it means. It means to go home. Now, now some of you may do this in the morning. Some of you do it at noontime. Maybe you do it at night. But it means to take the Bible. It means to maybe put on a worship CD. It means to open it up. And it means to sit a spell. I mean, grab a cup of coffee and sit down, begin to read God's word, begin to digest God's word, begin to study God's word. Maybe get on Google, ask Google or Siri or someone else to say, hey, what does this mean, Siri? What does this mean, Google? Or what's the new one? What's the Google? Alexa, yeah, Alexa. Hildegard, you know, whatever, you know. I mean, you, and you ask them, and you start studying the word of God. That is what the psalmist is saying. It's time for you and I as believers to actually dwell, to sit there, to meditate on God's word, to begin to talk to him, to begin to worship him, to begin to sacrifice ourselves, giving up those things that we're struggling about, the fear, anxiety, the doubt, all that stuff. I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? 
to take upon his yoke and his burden, for his burden is light and his yoke is easy. And so the Bible says that we need to, d- to dwell. The Greek word is yashab. It's talked about 1,100 times in the Old Testament. 1,100 times in the Old Testament. That the Bible tells us to just dwell with him, with El Shaddai, with El Elyon, with Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rophe. Oh, we're getting there in, the, in a couple weeks. Come on now. Come on. And then the psalmist tells us that, that we are to dwell in the, dwell in the secret place. Yeah, I know some of you guys have those secret places, right? I know where you go to get away from your wife (laughs) and the kids. You go to that secret place. I know, I know. I go there too. Get away. The man cave. The man cave. But see, the psalmist here, he's saying that that I want you to go to that secret place, okay? The Bible says that you're to go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father in heaven. But I don't necessarily think, and I could be theologically wrong, but I don't necessarily think that that these are the same things. Okay, that the Bible says uh, to go into the secret place of the Almighty. Okay? And so he's not saying, the psalmist is not saying, I want you to go into your man cave, whatever. He's saying, I need you to go into where God is. The secret place. That's where where God is. And, and And it may be on a certain day, for me, this place. But it may be somewhere else. You know, wherever that secret place, wherever God is. God might not be working here, but God may be working over here. He may say, uh, you know, he may tell, tell uh, I'm picking on Lori today. I, I've already mentioned Lori's name about ten times. But, you know, he, he may say, Lori, this is where I want you to go. And Lori, but what, I'm over here though. You know, I'm doing this over here because I need to get this done and this done. And I can do ministry over here. But that's not his secret place. That's not where he's, he, that's not where he's moving and ministering and flowing. How many of you have been in the Assemblies of God long, or in church long enough or Assemblies of God long enough where you hear all these breakout places that God is moving? Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, I'm in the wrong place then. I, we all have, we've all heard that, right? There's breakout places. And, and, and oh, I got to go there. And oh, I got to go there. And I got to go there to get a touch from God. Well, maybe... But I'm not so sure because I know that God is working right here because there's body of believers here, right? The secret place. Where is that secret place? You've got to find him. You've got to find him. And the only way that you're going to be able to find him in that secret place is if you begin to dwell with him, begin to hear his voice, begin to know how he speaks to your spirit Bible says it's deep calling unto deep. And so where is this secret place? It's a covering. It's a disguise. It's a protection is what the psalmist is talking about. Psalm 27, 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. That's the secret place. He's going to hide me Where I'm not going to be fearful and anxiety ridden and doubtful. He's going to hide me in his pavilion. Hallelujah. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Psalm 31, 20 says this. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. That's a dwelling place, right? If people are out to get you, get in his secret place so that he can op- that he can reveal the plots of the enemy. Come on, church. Psalm 20 or Psalm 32:7 says, "You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall uh, sh- uh, surround me with songs of deliverance." The secret place the psalmist talks about is a covering disguise or protection God bestows upon his children that covers every 
area of your life. Hallelujah. So what am I saying here? Therefore, if you sit, abide, inhabit, or remain, that means dwell, in the covering, disguise, or protection, meaning the secret place, of the uppermost authority, meaning the Almighty God in our universe, God, then you shall abide under the shadow of the all-sufficient. Can you say praise the Lord? And so then we look at that last thing that, that the psalmist asks us to do, to dwell, to find the secret place, and then or the dwelling place, and then the shadow. And last week, I, I, I wanted to spend more time, I don't know if I even spend more time on it today, but, but the shadow, okay? You've got to understand where he's coming from in the Old Testament. You've got to understand the picture that he sees, that the psalmist sees. He sees the picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Turn your name and say, Ark of the Covenant. He sees that picture, and he sees what's on top of the Ark of the Covenant. What's on top of the Ark of the Covenant? It's the cherubim on each side, okay? The Ark of the Covenant is however big it was. You can look in the Bible and find out, because I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, you see the cherubim on either side, and then you see what in the middle? The mercy seat. Yeah. And so the psalmist sees that picture, and he's saying, if you will abide under the what? The shadow of the Almighty. Underneath the cherubim's wings is a shadow that is cast over the mercy seat. Now we understand in, in the New Testament, now that Jesus died on the cross, he rose again. And be, if we will accept Christ as our Savior, there's forgiveness of sin. That is the mercy seat in the New Testament, right? But the psalmist is saying, okay, if you will abide under the shadow, if you will abide on the mercy seat, and that's where Christ is. If you will abide in Christ. Man, I've heard that several times in the Bible. If you will abide in Christ, then all these things that you struggle with, you know, maybe you struggle with anger. Maybe you struggle with, uh, with arrogance. Not you, but maybe me. You know, maybe you struggle with, I don't know, what else do you struggle with? Rick, what do you struggle with? Come on, brother, we're laying it out. No. <laughs> bad thoughts. Oh, I feel your pain, brother. I feel your pain. Yeah, bad thoughts. I mean, if you struggle with that and you, it, it grips you and whatever, God is saying, abide under the shadow, the mercy seat where Jesus Christ is. If you will abide in him, then all of that stuff will pass away. It won't be as substantial in your life. And so the, the psalmist says, if you will sit, abide, inhabit, or remain in his covering, disguise, or protection of the uppermost authority in our universe, God, then you shall abide under the safety, mercy, and forgiveness of the all-sufficient God, can you say praise the Lord? So with all of this said, and, and this is the part that I wanted to add for this Sunday morning, along with what you sow into is what you're going to reap. Lost my place. So with all of this said, when we practice that hidden life, okay, that's what we just talked about, Psalm 91, the hidden life, only what God sees. God will provide the protected life for every one of us. Okay, one person got that. So here, this becomes the question to my leaders. If you're a leader, raise your hand in church. Okay, this is my question to you guys. If we do not do the things that the psalmist asks us to do or the Bible asks us to do, is God required to protect us, to come through on who he is and what he is and what he can do for us? I, I'm just asking, okay, what, Larry, you said no. Okay, who else, what, did you, what do you say? Are you sure? Why? Now, see, I'm really pulling, I'm, I'm getting him now, you know what I'm saying? Do you have a reason why? Because it says so. That's why he's our leader. That is why he's our leader. Okay, who, huh? It's the law of sowing and reaping. 
Yeah. <laughs> Golf clap for Chris. Okay, now, I, I, I know sometimes I get ADD and really excited and I forget to really stop. And, and the Bible says uh, in Psalm, in a lot of Psalms, it says sila. What does that mean? It means to think about it. A lot of times I don't just stop and then just address you guys and think about it. Think about that. If God's word says this, that, we're, that God will do this if we do this, then if we don't do this, then is God still liable for him to do what he said he can do? Okay, so then why don't we do it? Why do, why do we not do it? Why do we continue? Do you like that? Yeah, that's good. You want me to do it again? No, I better not. Okay, but I lost my train of thought because of you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? Why would you rather stay in anxiety, fear, doubt, depression, financial insecurity, uh, problems with your spouse? Why, why do you want to stay in that addiction? Why do you want to stay in that when God says, look, if you will just do this and you will pour your heart out, then I will do this. Why do we do that? That's my question to you this morning. That's God's question to you this morning. He, he gives you a choice, man. He opens the door for you every single day. And so he'll, he'll provide that protected life for you, right? And so we look at an ancient, ancient uh, you know, when Jesus walked and before. I mean, it was, uh, when you're out traveling the roads, I mean, they didn't have the police on the side of the roads, let me just say that. And, uh, and it was rough out there. I mean, there were bandits out there, and, and you would, uh, you probably wouldn't last very long unless you had guards, unless you had, unless you were beef, you know, buff yourself, right? Or somebody, people that were kind of with you to protect you. And that's kind of the picture that God is saying. Look at, at verse 5. If we move on, it says, uh, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. And so we talked about if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you shall abide on the shadow of the Almighty. And then the psalmist goes on to say, uh, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day. He's talking about those people that can, can, can beat you up on the side of the road. He's talking about the devil, right? He's talking about the devil that's, you know, all those, uh, we're supposed to put on the, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, gird our waist with truth, shotting our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's like you're walking along and you're stepping on all these rocks, right? That the gospel protects us. He's saying, like, like God will be your protector if you do these things. But you got to do these things. So what are we fearful? What are those things that we're fearful in our life? I don't know. I mean, I'm fearful of Karen sometimes. <laughs> Man, I think I just said something wrong there. She said, honey, when you get home, you are going to, you know. What? Cook lunch. Yeah, cook. you're going to cook your own lunch because you said that. See, but what are we fearful about? They were fearful. They were fearful. Paul, I want you to get ready here in a few minutes. Uh, they, they were fearful of the dark, maybe. They were fearful of contaminated water or food. They were fearful of an a absence of, of, of comprehensive health care in that day, right? They were maybe fearful uh, of the, the burning sun upon them at day. I mean, what are you fearful uh, today? What are the things that you're fearful about? And God is saying, look, if you will do these things, then I will be your protector. And you don't have to worry about it. That's what the psalmist is saying right here. What are those situations that could happen? How many of us think about those woulda, coulda, shoulda things, right? Oh, that could have that. Oh, 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 oh. You know, and, and then Satan begins to twist and turn your mind. And God is saying, no, 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 no. That's not the way I want you to live. That's not how I want you to function as a believer, as my child. You have victory over all that stuff. But that's what the psalmist here is trying to, trying to display to us. 
See, every one of us have those thoughts of what could happen to us. I've went through seasons after seasons of, of Satan just boom, you know, different things in my mind until I learned to take authority over that stuff. Can you say amen? We have to take authority over our thought mind. And so knowing to sit, abide, and have it remain in the covering, disguised protection of the uppermost authority in our universe, God, then I will abide under the shadow of the all-sufficient God. That nothing shall come near us. Verse 7 says, A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall what? Not come near us. You. Man, you got to get this truth in your spirit this morning. Why? Why will all of this stuff that would have, should have, could have happened, why will it not come near you? Verse 8 says this, Only with the eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you, verse 9, excuse me, not verse 8. Because you have made... You have made who? The Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, talking about, uh, you know, going back to verse, uh, verse 1. You have made even the Most High your dwelling place. That's why all of that stuff will not befall you. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Paul, I want you to come this morning. And uh, the closing, the closing uh, story that I thought about was Exodus. Let's go there. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14. Looking at verse 26. And this is what Moses says. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters turned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of the Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Ah, it just dawned on me. Not so much as a trace of those things that you struggle with today will be of any significance tomorrow when you enter into his dwelling place. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Just like what Moses said. Not so much as one of them remained. Not a trace. But the children of Israel had walked on dry. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps, Larry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptian, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work. Listen. When we start doing this stuff, we are going to see the great work of God. Can you say praise the Lord? In our families, in our churches, in our communities. But we got to do the work. We got to pay the price. I, please, understand, take that in context. Christ paid the price, but we have to sacrifice our time. You know, things that we want to do to things that God is asking us to do. All that stuff. 
Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord. Oh, come on, that's another sermon series right there. And believed the Lord, and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Stand with me, please. Now, I'm assuming that those people that struggle with fear, anxiety, doubt, financial problems, uh, relational issues, I'm assuming that that's none of you here this morning because I'm going to have an altar call. Okay, so that's my assumption, right? Nobody wants to come in the front. Prayer team, would you come? But if I assume that, I'd be kidding myself, right, uh, Rick? I'd, I'd be kidding myself. And so I'm telling you, I'm asking you, put off your fleshly desire to walk out the back door, go home, put that off and say, no, I need God. I need God right now. Not, not, maybe not every one of us need, need God, like, you know. I remember my, my mom does one time. We're sitting in church. I'm like 16 years old. Yes, teenagers should be in church. Thought I'd get more of a reaction to that, but oh well, whatever. I'm sitting in church, and my mom is weeping and crying. And I'm like, pull yourself together, mom. Like, you know, what's going on? And I was like, what's going on? She's like, not leaving until I get a touch from God. I am not leaving until I, she needed God. Some of you this morning, man, that's where you're at. Start coming. Start coming. Come to the front, be prayed for. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that is ours to be in, in this moment right now. Father in heaven, we ask that you by your spirit would stir in our hearts. Father, that you would not let us go here. But Father, we would take care of business. Lord, we would be gladiators this morning. And Father, we'd begin to fight that junk that's been going around in our minds, that Satan has been twisting and turning and his demonic principality has been twisting and turning. And Father, we just uh, come, uh, we take authority over that now in the name of Jesus Christ. We cancel its power. We cancel its authority in our lives. We are no longer going to think about that anymore. But Father, we are choosing to lift up God Almighty. We are choosing to lift up the Almighty God, El Elyon, El Shaddai. And Father, you are our source and you are our strength. And you are going to help us by the power of your spirit and by your mercy, you're going to help us, God, to work through this stuff, to keep our mind focused on, on these things. Philippians 4, 8 says, think about those things that are pure, holy, just, praiseworthy. If they have any virtue, if they have any good rapport, that we would think on those things. And God, you're going to help us to do that in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. Father, we just take authority over hurting fractured relationships words that have been spoken out of anger jealousy out of deceit father we take authority over those words in the name of Jesus Christ we take authority over those actions in the name of Jesus Christ father that there would be repentance that rests upon people that have that have spewed those words in Jesus name Father, that you would restore those relationships, whether it's husband, wives, fathers to their children, mothers to their children, workers to their bosses, bosses to their workers, family member to family member, church member to church member, whatever it is. Father, we take authority over that junk and we command it to flee in Jesus' name. Father, restore it. Restore those relationships. Father, we ask that you would call people back to church. God, that they would have a desire to come and fellowship 
with the brethren, that they would have a desire to serve the kingdom of God through their local church. Father, they would come and they would, they would, des uh, they would desire to serve alongside their staff that they've hired that they would choose to support them in prayer and actions and in deed. Father, we thank you for that. Father, your church is going to be a glorious church without spot nor wrinkle. Lord, help us to, to do these, these tangible tasks, if you will, in honoring your word, in honoring you, more than we want to build ourselves up. And we thank you for it. Father, we commit the rest of this service. Lord, it's yours and it's the people's. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. God bless you. for 